Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 132 for Monday, September 18th, 2017. <music> Greetings, folks. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. As always, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How goes it that, uh, this fine Monday, Mr. Kent? It's a pretty good Monday. How are you, Dave? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I um, had, I've had actually uh, had some interesting gigs recently. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, we did, we did... Uh, a thing that that we wound up calling Fling and Friends, uh, which really was organized by largely by our bass player. And it was at this kind of um, just an event hall near us. It's, it's sort of a I don't know. It's, it's hard to describe, but it's just sort of a loose place out in the woods. It's event hall that this guy recently bought from the previous owner. It's kind of been cursed. It's never really worked out financially for anybody. But but this guy's excited and, and maybe he's the right one to make it work. But um, our bass player organized it, and he is rarely, if ever, involved in the act active organization of, of gigs. Not that he's not interested in it. Uh, he's just, you know, he, th there's other people in the band that sort of, you know, make that stuff happen, and, and he, uh, he does his part. But, um, but he really wanted to uh, – he wanted to organize a, a, a thing, and so – uh, he sort of took the reins on this. I was going to say, so we, we let him, but it wasn't even that it was just what possessed him to do it. Um, I think, you know, last week you made a comment. You said my couple of minutes to shine. And, uh, and, and it was in the context of, you know, somebody in the joining the band or whatever. And, you know, everybody wants to have my couple of minutes to shine, right. Whatever that means. And, uh, and I think this was this was it for for Burke. He um, his couple of minutes to shine. It, it, and I, this is my perspective, uh, but he's one of those people who I think defines his couple of minutes to shine by. I want to sing the songs that I would like to hear. Uh -huh. And um, and so and, and the songs that he likes to hear are are uh, frankly uh, obscure mid-tempo numbers that often don't have a place hard to place really hard to place yeah. yeah like like the most i would say the most well-known song that that he likes to sing is is like the grateful dead sugary which yeah. is which is i mean certainly people know it but i mean it 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 just shuffles along on at a, yeah. you know snail's pace right so uh, and it was like a month before the gig, he sent out this set list and everything. And he's been, he's been working with, you know, like we all do, he's been working with some other musicians and he wanted to bring other people in to play or whatever, which is great. It, you know, we, we do that stuff uh, here and there. And so that, that part of it was fine. And he kind of put together this whole list of, okay, you know, this band's going to have a, a, you know, you know, this particular lineup's going to have, you know, five songs here, or this particular lineup's going to have whatever. But it was like, it wasn't just carving out slots. It was, here's the songs a month uh. before the gig, which was a little surprising and, 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 and started to give me a little bit of anxiety. It was like, okay, we're calling this a fling gig, but this is not going to be anything like any other fling gig. I, I, it's a, it's a Burke gig. It's a Burke gig. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. And, um, and so my only concern going into it was what, like what happens if we attract a normal fling crowd for this thing that wants to hear the songs and, you know, the flow of things that they're used to with a fling gig, like we got to have an option to, you know, pull the ripcord and, and, and go, you know, and finish this night up in a way that, that, um, that sort of delivers that. Uh, so we didn't do as much promotion for this as we normally would have. Cause we all sort of, uh, not all of us, several of us were sort of feeling that same thing. Like, okay, this wants to go in one direction. Um, 
if we if we you know if we attract all the people that normally come to see us it's going to almost have to go in a different direction so let's just not do that let's let burke have his you know his his moment to shine right why wouldn't you bill it that way though well that's what we should have done uh. yeah no in in retrospect that that was it it's just we you know we started putting this thing together a few months ago and that's and then and we started billing it as fling and friends and it was going to have these other people and then when it was obvious that it wasn't just these other people, but it was this and this very hand selected set list that really serves like one one interest. Right. You know, it's not like, all right, let's build a set list that sort of incorporates what everybody might want to do. It's like, nope, here's this one. And it was like, oh, yeah, if we had just called it like, you know, the the Durham pot luck jam or something that then it like I wouldn't have had any anxiety going into the gig at all. Well, what? I would, I would have done is I would have called it, you know, Brook Knight or something like that. Yeah, right. Fling, right. So something yeah, to do, yeah, yeah. let you know it's fling, but we're doing something different mm-hmm. and we're featuring this one band member. And, you know, it's like we've done that with birthday gigs. Right. We've yeah. done that with like after Stevie Wonder w- came through town, half my band went and saw Stevie Wonder. I knew they were all hot to play all their Stevie stuff. And so, you know, we said we we're going to play all Stevie stuff. That is all our Stevie stuff. Right. So just kind of setting the expectation. And it works for you because totally. your fans, your yeah. fans like that you're doing something different. You're just being clear about it. Yeah. And those fans who only come because they like that it's a dance night are at least given a you oh, know a little bit of heads, a heads up. up. Yeah. No, that's that's a um that that yeah that that would have been a better way to build this thing. Although it it sort of worked out that way anyway. Um, right. Even though like in retrospect, that's exactly right. Yeah. That that's that's the way to do this if we're going to do it again. Um, but it was interesting, you know, and it, 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 um, it was odd. So I'm very used to playing, uh, the role of sideman, right. Where, you know, I'm hired for a gig. I show up, you tell me what songs we're going to play. I play them, you know, uh, what do you, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to play, um, you know, do you want me to, to just play the drums? Do you want me singing harmonies on any of these songs? Just tell me what you want. I'll do it. Right. And that, like my gigs with Amanda are, are, are like that. Um, but it's weird playing the role of sideman in, what, in, your own uh, band. in what otherwise appears to be your own band. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, and so that was that part of it was a little um, it was odd. But, you know, it's one of those things. It's just like, OK, let's let's step outside of the comfort zone for a little bit. And in as always, you know, I learned some things like some of these tunes like Sugary would actually be a great breather tune after you've had like a string of, you know, five or six high energy songs. You got a nice breather. And it's it's we find that uh, for most gigs that we play, people like that sort of breather and they almost create it on their own. So it's handy to really spoon feed that to them like, okay, you know, now you can go sit and like pee and refresh your drinks or whatever. And then we're going to rage it up again and, you know, finish out the set or whatever that is. And yeah. Yeah. So, so it was nice to play some of these tunes and be like, Oh, actually this could work this way and this way, you know, I wouldn't do a whole night of it because w- what happens and what happened during all these tunes is everybody just sort of, you know, chit chatted amongst themselves. There were, a bu- there were enough musicians there that people were, you know, respectfully paying attention or whatever, but it wasn't like, you know, people were up and grooving and, and all of that, because that's just not going to happen with those types. Did of the whole band kind of ease into a, all right, this is Burke's night. Yep. And we're just going to, we're going to take a different position than we usually do. And, you know, he's doing all the heavy lifting. So let's just go with it and see what happens. That's pr- pretty much. Yeah. That's how we, how we sort of uh, finally came to terms with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How'd it go? Um, it went fine. It was actually a, it, the venue worked out well. I do other gigs there. It's like I said, it's sort of a half inside, half outside kind of kind of thing. So to do this in the summer around here would be kind of fun. It 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 really it's private property. Uh, so, you know, there's it's it's um, it's almost like you're throwing a party in your in your backyard, except it's somebody else's backyard with a with a, you know, with an actual building with a kind of yeah. stage and that sort of Your thing. Your landscape is so much different than our landscape, Correct. right? You, you know, yes. you have farms and land and, yes. you know, yeah, this things. Is, that- right. It's like we had a party on our farm, except it was that guy's farm, not our farm. Right, yeah. right, right, yeah, right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So it was um, cool. Yeah, yeah. Did you learn anything from doing the gig? Um, Like I said, I learned that. I, I learned that um, it's, it's important to, 
you know, in every band, Burke's one of the quiet people in uh, in our band. And, and that's true. Right. In every in any band, it's rare that you, you could actually have success if you had like five people just like you or me where, you know, it's ideas and opinions and all of that, like up front all the time. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, everybody you've got different personalities and Burks is, is certain sort of one of the, I mean, he's a really smart guy, like super smart guy and uh, very talented and all that, but he generally keeps his opinions, you know, to himself. Um, right. And, and so to sort of it, let him just do that um, and see what would happen to an evening if it went exactly the way he wanted it to go. Um, I, I think that's, that's a good thing to see when you're in. How, when how you're did he think somewhere. it went? How did, how did I think it went or how did he think did, it went? How did Burke think it went? Well, see, that's the thing. He's a quiet guy. I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> I, I think he was happy though. I think he was happy. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have this kind of modified democracy that, that Correct. you work with. And so, you know, I always try and, keep my eye on the kind of linear process of it. And I'm, I'm constantly reminded that, you know, you need to go out to, to the left and right every once in a while in order to keep your band feeling cohesive. You know what I mean? Yes. So, so yes, Ex that's yeah, exactly so a guy's, it. right. A guy's birthday and he wants to pick the set list. You know, we'll do that every once in a while. Uh, you know, and again, not everybody wants that. And so I can't, I guess, you know, I have one guy in my band who's pretty quiet, doesn't speak up too much. You know, we'll kind of like in the back channel, offer some opinions about time stuff. But when his family is coming to a gig and, you know, he has a big family, he'll speak more, you know, like, can we do this? My family really likes this. And, you know, he'll kind of do that. And, you know, I find that that's a. I guess whether it's a, a leadership or a democratic process, it's just smart to not be heavy handed on the on the, on the mission of your band and, right. you know, th throw, throw the love around and let people feel like they're connected in whatever way works for them. Whether it's, you know, if it's a guy who's an instrumentalist and you give him more solos, yeah. you know, I have five horns and, and, uh, you know, making sure that if someone is celebrating a birthday, has a new date that they're trying to impress or whatever it might be, yeah, totally. uh, you know, yep. given, given that, like you said, time to shine. Yeah. It's that time to, time to shine. And, and the hard part, especially with those quieter people, is sort of sussing out yeah. what that really is. I mean, you might think, oh, yeah, you know, I'm throwing Burke, a, you know, a couple of tunes every set or whatever. And uh, this is like, I think he likes this stuff. I think this is I think this is checking those boxes. Right. Yeah. And then you realize, well, but it's not just those. He wants to play these other tunes like, you know, a Bruce Coburn tune that might be <laughs> unknown to everyone in the room and he, perhaps even in the town that you're playing in. Right. It's like, OK, well, like but but as you know, like we've talked about before, if the band really kills on one of those tunes, it can work. It, you know, the obscurity can be overcome by. Uh, performance and commitment and, and delivery that said, you know, in fling, we also are an original band, right? We have a, sl a ton. We could do a whole night of originals. So when it comes to deciding, should we throw in an obscure cover that nobody knows, or should we throw in an obscure original that we wrote? The answer is pretty easy to, to go with. Yeah, the why not use that space? Sure. Right. Yeah. So that's sort of been the problem is if we're going to throw in something that is, quote unquote, obscure, it's going to be one that we wrote, not some song that, you know, appeared on the not even on the B side of whatever. And, you know, um, so that but but balancing that with these, this is what Burke, you know, this is what he enjoys. Like, oh, hmm. OK, like, yeah. got to keep that in mind. Like, it, you know, it's like, it's, but it's hard. Well, you know, a couple of things. One is sometimes those kind of chill personalities, they actually are usually just fine. I mean, you know, like it makes you want to you want to bring it out of them, but actually they're cool just being part of the band and doing their part. But then sometimes that turns into all of a sudden, if you haven't paid attention to their needs, that's the problem. All of a sudden you get a little dis disaffected, you know, right. Yes. They're disaffected and, and you, and yeah, you miss an opportunity. Up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just, you know, like a smart thing to keep an eye for. The other thing about those obscure tunes and, and them killing, it's an interesting path to that. Right. So what I find is it starts with band buy-in. A hundred percent. 
Yes. And one one person, no matter if it's a 10 piece band, five piece band, four piece band, three piece band, one person can affect that buy in tremendously because you already have to sell something that's not an obvious thing to your audience. And so a band like I've always thought if a band is all together on it, you can sell, you know, rock polka songs if you're having a good time and you're purveying yes. a good time. And, you know, you can do that. But all it takes is one person to roll their eyes or not be into it or clearly be uncomfortable. You know, yep. even with best intention, uh, they're not into it. The whole energy vibes. Then oh, it on doesn't. Top of that, yeah. Then you're not you're not even hitting like your baseline, let alone exactly. where you really need to be to, to, to sell this tune that nobody actually knows. Right. And then, you know, sometimes you need serendipity. You need it to be the right crowd at the right time, you know, the song, the right part of the set list, and then it go over and then everybody feel real good about it. That, that, and then it sets a, a tone for the, for that song. Um, but again, you need a little bit of good luck sometimes to make those you things do. go over. Well, and you need good luck that the song happens to work for your band. Yeah. Right. I mean, and I mean, that's true of all of these tunes, but you can fake your way through an awful version of Mustang Sally and people won't hear the awful version of Mustang Sally necessarily. They'll just hear, oh, ride, Sally, ride. Let's dance. Right. Yeah. But if it's an awful version of some song they don't know, they will definitely hear that it's awful. Yeah. And so, yeah, you, you it really needs to be like the right song for the band. And and uh, and one of the problems and I, I mentioned this before that that, you know, um, that we've dealt with. Uh, and I may say we I mean, I mean, all of us. But Burke often has a specific version of a song in mind when he plays it. Sure. And that's a really hard thing. I get that. Thing. I, I, do you? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you why I get it because yeah. you, know, you have the song that, that, uh, you know, it has a base level of joy to it, you know, makes you happy to listen to it and stuff like that. And then usually you hear an artist do something to something you already like mm -hmm. and kind of take it to a new place that delights you. And you're actually hearing a live version where you're hearing how the audience is reacting to it. Right. So it kind of has the, you know, all these kind of elements of freshness, but familiarity plus, you know, re reimagined in a way that gets people excited about it. I, you know, I said, we, most of the stuff I bring to the band is from a live version of something I hear somewhere yeah. has some cool break, has some cool breakdown, you know, has some, you know, you know, cool endings or, or whatever it might be, you already like the song. Yeah. And then you see the artists, you know, find some way to extrapolate even more, more magic from it. I, I, I understand that entirely. And I guess for deadheads, which Burke's a deadhead, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what it, yeah, exactly. That's, that's part and parcel of the experience, right? Yes, it is right. But it's, it's really hard to, to get a, a, a band. I mean, certainly our band, but any band to play, that version exactly like that other band that wrote the song played it on any particular night. So I've extracted my ability a little bit to get the essence of what's going on. Right. It doesn't have to be exactly. Yeah. But if there's a, you know, a key change or if there's oh. a, you know, if there's a breakdown or there's a, you know, part where you open up the song to audience participation, the essence of it, it doesn't have to be exactly. And actually what I find is, uh, the band gets uncomfortable being asked to cop something from a live recording exactly it's, because it's, it's so hard to the non fan. The spontaneity is hard to kind of it, grasp. Yeah, it doesn't, right? It's not, it doesn't even exist. Right. But to you, a fan. It's, it's, it's it. It's that's what you're totally what it. turning yes. you on. I totally right. get it. No, I, I get it too. I guess like I, and I've said this many times, I think growing up in uh, as a, like a total prog rock head, um, you know, I would play prog rock with like friends or whatever that were into it, but you could never really get gigs doing that. Um, nobody, nobody else was really interested in hearing a, a band, especially a band of like high schoolers or whatever, try and play like Russian yes tunes. Cause you, you could never really play them well. Um, and so I, I, I sort of gave up on connecting those two worlds. Like, this is what I love to listen to. And, and then there's the music I play and the two for me like almost have nothing to do with each other. And I think it's because of that, right. That I had to like, okay, well I wouldn't go listen to these songs that I'm going to go play like cure tunes and REM tunes or whatever. I hated those bands. Right. But it was <laughs> like, but, it, but I, I, you know, I was, I also didn't listen to a lot of, of concert band music. And yet I played in concert bands, you know, constantly every day I was rehearsing with a concert band in school. So it was like, okay, well this is fine. I'm just going to go play music. I enjoy 
playing for playing's sake. And I found that was the same with Cure and REM tunes. And then it turns out those are actually really good tunes. And once you get into them, there's a lot of great stuff to find. And 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 so tunes have made the the cross back, right? Like I've played this. Now I like to listen to this band. And and like in the case of REM, they became one of my favorite bands ever. Sure. You know, but um but it, but it never goes the other way. Very rarely do I hear something that I'm listening to because I just want to listen to it and say, oh, we have to do that. Like it just it, sometimes I'll hear something and think, oh, wow, like that would be perfect for fling or that would be perfect for monkey fist. Like you just know that that this is going to work over there. But but when you do that, or when I do that. You kind of have to take like, okay, here's the essence, like you said, and hand it off to the band and know that it's going to be different. Like, you you know, when I hear it and say, oh, Fling's going to do a great job with this. I I'm already like pre putting that through the Fling filter of like, you know, that's a band of five people that are different than the people that played the version I just heard. They're we're going to play it differently and that's okay. I think the way we play, it's going to actually work out really well, you know, and sometimes I'm wrong and sometimes I'm right. Yeah. And then you just punt on it if it doesn't work like anything else. But um, but it's tough when you're playing and you can tell that that somebody on stage is playing along to the version in their head and not the version that we're playing on stage. Yeah. And it's just tough to get that, to, you know, because you want them to be happy. But you also kind of like need everybody present in the version. Yeah, I, that's think, being I think the answer lies in. um in giving your musicians the latitude to reinterpret again, because you're, you know, you have to, Yeah, I, I think that that's the way to get buy-in is like, you know, I'd like some, and that seems to be the more that I've tried to funnel people into boxes of, um, of things specific that I want with things that they're not familiar with. Yeah. And, and they're sensing my frustration when I'm not hearing what I want to hear. And they're, they're actually legitimately trying. I think, I think that in there is, is a pretty tough, tough problem to solve. But the flip side of that is that if you can, you know, craft, take the essence of what you've heard, you know, like I said, breakdowns. Yes. Yes. You know, alternate things and just say, Hey, I want to do something like this here and then let everybody kind of work at it and figure it out together. And then you go, you always have the reference if you need to go back to, you know, square zero and start refiguring out if if you're not getting anywhere. But, but I think in there you get more buy-in. Totally. I know this a lot with my Springsteen stuff that I bring into the band. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, I'm not going to tell you note for note. And then some stuff actually I've had to, I've had to bail cause I can't get my head around not hearing what I think I should hear yes. to, to sing over it. Right. So when it doesn't, when there's a feel that's not right for me, I've just had to bail sometimes and stop trying to shoehorn the perception. And that, and maybe that's what we're talking about here. Oh, is that's that exactly what we're talking about. Five yeah. people listen to a recording and, and it's really important to you. And you think other people listening to the recording are going to catch those things, those nuances, those, you know, subtle things that make this thing pop for you or special for you. And the other guys are like, all right, I get it. He's kind of doing this here, kind of doing that, kind of doing this, kind of doing that. It's about as much as you're going to get. That's what you're going to get. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, like, like, uh, I mean, it's true with, with any band that you go and hear them do their own songs live, but you know, the dead is a great example. I don't think listening to that one version of Scarlet Begonias is going to communicate to uh, to anyone what it is about that one version that 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 makes a difference. I think you need to go listen to 10 other versions. That's very true. And and hear what the difference actually is. Like you need to have this 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 library and this this fundam this foundation in order to then interpret that in a way that you're like, oh, because I've had that happen over time. Like I'll play a song in a band and it'll be that kind of thing where somebody, you know, I'll remember this painful rehearsal or string of rehearsals where somebody's like, no, it's kind of like this. And you're like, yeah, that's what I'm playing. They play the version. And you're like, yeah, that's what I'm playing. And then five years later, I'll hear like three other versions of the tune and be like, Oh, I see what they were trying to tell me here, but that's really hard to communicate when you have no other frame of reference. You're just like right in it. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. But, um, but yeah, the gig went well. It was, it was, you know, it was good. That was, yeah. Hey, I, um, I, I, I have one thing and then, and then I'm, I actually want to hear about your Springsteen show, but, um, I, cause which you did last night, I think. 
Uh, I went and saw the Trey Anastasio band on. Uh, oh, I saw you posted some pictures. Looked like a cool venue. It was a really cool venue. It was just this outdoor field, really kind of on a peninsula right in Maine. It was really, really nice. Uh, small venue. There weren't that many people there. Maybe, you know, I think the most the place would hold was maybe 5,000 and it wasn't full. It was, you know, maybe 3,500 people or something. Uh, Did you know the guys in his band? So I, I yes, he's had the same band for a while. And, um, his keyboard player, Ray Pachkowski, actually used to play uh, in a band with with Burke, believe it or not, um, years ago when they were in college together. And we actually cover one of Ray's tunes, this tune called Get Back Home. But um, but yeah, he's got, you know, his band is great and he's got three horn players, uh, uh, a trumpet, trombone and a sax player. And they all sing the, the trumpet and trombone players are, are women. The sax player is a guy. They all sing and and two of them play keyboards as well. And yeah. And, and so, um, we were watching them and, and they're kind of off stage, right. You know, um, not off stage, but they're, they're positioned, you know, front of stage, right. Uh, and they all have their vocal microphones in front of them. And I happened to catch like just in the middle of this one tune, I happened to catch the sax player uh, go and there's a microphone sort of behind all three of them facing the other direction. And I'm watching him and it looks like he's singing into this microphone, but just like singing, not singing words, really just like singing. And I'm, I'm listening, like maybe there's some weird effect on this mic that I should be hearing in the midst of this, you know, like thing that's happening or whatever. I'm like, no, I don't think so. And then I see the other two look at him and start nodding their heads. And, and then they all went up and grabbed their horns and, and he counted them in like three, four. And they all played this unison figure that they hadn't been playing in the middle of this this uh, this jam before. And Trey started playing off of it, and they did that a couple of times. And then the the trumpet player turned around and said something into the microphone, and the horn players looked at her and nodded. You know, the other two horn players looked at her and nodded, and and yeah. they came back. and And so it's it's this on stage communication, Mike. But I think the guy really was singing into it. He was just singing a melody, a horn part. Yeah. yeah. And it was really like that's for a for a band like that where you've got things and you want them to sort of happen spontaneously in the moment, having that ability to communicate without having to you know shout all over <laughs> what's happening around you. Right, right. It was really interesting and it worked really well. It, I mean, they didn't do it all the time, but but there were a few moments where it was like, oh, I have an idea, let's do this. And of course, you know, these have got to be top. They are top notch players and are able to just hear someone sing a melody and be like, oh yeah, I got it. You know, good to go. Let's play. <laughs> yeah. But it was interesting. It was, it was, it, it, well, I told you that happened to us one time. We had um, an interesting night where we had a really good paying gig that we got on short notice and three of my horns couldn't play. And so I hired three like really top flight guys. One guy uh, plays for Huey Lewis. One guy is a Grammy winner with his, his uh, Pacific Mambo Orchestra. And one guy, you know, was really one of the top bone players in town, went to UCLA to get his PhD in music. And, you know, now is just tearing it up in LA. Yeah. Three top, top flight guys. We were playing, I think it was Sweet Home Alabama. By the end of the first chorus, they hummed to each other a line and all, and not just a line. I mean, yeah. like blew it out of the park. It was just, <laughs> it was so cool. I mean, yeah, you know, guys with ears like that and That's guys it. no communication, they just, it's a, it's a, there is another level when you get to that top level of pro, right? Totally. You know, there's, Yep. Musical dictionaries and the ability to communicate ideas in real time and, you know, pick up on something. I mean, that's really the thing, right? If you're a pro musician, you walk into a studio, you're expected to be able to play anything they ask you to play, right? Mm -hmm. Not like I'm good at this, but not good at this. You can, that, that won't get you any work. No, not, it won't get you enough work. I don't think. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. So it was, yeah, it was exactly what, what you just described. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, I have an idea. Here we go. Boom. And then they like layered these two ideas and then another one came in and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> like, just like you said, like it didn't take them long at all. And suddenly cool the whole, that whole flavor of the tune changed. It was like, whoa. And yeah. it was a tune I'd heard before. And it still, it was like hundred percent. This, this, this version could be just like we were talking about in the previous, you know, discussion, like, all right, that's the version the, the band should play. Learn that horn part that they came up with on the, on the spot and, you know, like that, that kind of thing. But it's cool. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So how'd your Springsteen gig go? So lots to share with that. Um, so remember I did it in April and I sold the place out pretty much like 120 seats. Yeah. And it was mostly people 65, 70% people who knew me. So I kind of had a Homer crowd. Uh, this one was a little bit of a harder sell. 
it was in a different venue, a little bit farther away. Um, really, <clears throat> one sec. <laughs> of course, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clear yeah. my throat here. It was a you know really great venue. It's a, a music hall called Don Quixote's. It's um, over close to Santa Cruz, but in the mountains a little bit. But it's kind of a famous, you know, funky place for like all sorts of world music and stuff like that. 200 Thieves, it's a true music room. So nice stage, great sound system, small, funky, you know, kind of woodsy type of feel to it. But, you know, a very, very cool place to play. And so it was a seated show. But uh, like I said, there's about 40 people there. So it was a Sunday night because, you know, that's the night that, that uh, you know, they do these type of solo, smaller acoustic things. Sure. So uh, whereas last time was a Saturday night, and it was a big night out for people. So there were, there were a lot of things that were different about the lead up to this. And um, so when it's time for me to take the stage, you know, the room is about the room, like I said, holds about 200. It was set for, you know, kind of like cabaret seating. Uh, and there were about 40 people there. And so just a very different vibe. Nice. You know, half the room were people who knew me, half the room were people just bought tickets. And, um, you know, we got into it and um, the vibe was different and the energy was different. And um, the, this is the subtle things that I think separate the true, true polished professional from the semi pro. Right. Yep. Like it got into my head that there's less people and less energy here. Oh, it's, and that oh, crossed I, my I head for a moment. Yeah. And I flubbed, a, I flubbed a line in a song, right? Because sure. your brain went somewhere else. Right. And then you're like, you, you, then your brain process is like, I better focus. Right. So, you know, close my eyes, just really tried to get in the moment, really tried to emote the, the you know, the music, which is not hard for me because it's the music I love so much, sure. but it was just a different vibe. And there were, you know, I played, I played pretty well, um, fairly well. Um, you know, the, the room was really warm and I started to have a little bit of intonation problems on, on one of my guitars. And so I decided to bail on, on switching guitars, which just kind of like, you know, made my game plan go out a little bit. Yeah. And so there were just a few things that knock you off kilter. And, and I, uh, I'm reminded that the lights go down and all eyes are on you for two, two and a half hours is a very different gig than playing in the corner of a restaurant. Very different gig than playing in a 10 piece band where there's a lot of other people doing stuff as well. I mean, and in, in a way there were moments when there was, when I was playing a soft song and there was total silence and I was keenly aware that people were focused on what I was doing. That is incredibly rewarding and cool. There were times where the song didn't feel quite right coming out of me at the moment for whatever it might be. Again, sure. might be the energy of the room. And then you get hyper, hyper, hyper focused on that. Yep. And it's very uncomfortable. And then, you know, my, my brain kind of goes to, well, this is what I signed up for this uncomfort. This is, you know, it's, I'm trying to, it. Yeah. Well, this is what, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to up level my skill set and all this type of stuff. And so it was a really interesting thing because it was much more in my head than the last one. And the last one was kind of like, almost an automatic pilot, you know, where I was incredibly well prepared. The room was a bunch of my, my people cheering me on, making it pretty easy. And, you know, momentum just kind of kicked in and everything worked well. This one, I felt like I had to like dig in, you know, and some things went great and some things went not as good as last time. And, uh, all in all, I'm grateful to be able to do this. Cause like I said, I do this one because I just really want to emote that music. I do it also because I'm really want to be a great performer. And so, uh, like I said, it, everything was not stacked in my favor. Some things were just different. Some, some things like the intonation, things were going a little bit wrong. Yep. And, uh, you know, I definitely sweated a little bit at certain points. And then some parts were really magic for me and really rewarding. But you are reminded that to be a great performer means great performer, no matter what's going on out there in the room or know what's going on on stage and being able to deliver the goods all the time. And I definitely still have a, you know, a lot of work to do to be able to overcome any obstacle. Some people maybe can just be charming all the time and find that witty thing to say, you know, that kind of eases the room and you sure. know, it grabs the room. That's not me naturally. And, you know, I certainly found myself at times in my head, I better say something here. And then, you know, what came out of my mouth wasn't really the most eloquent thing that I could have said. And then there were other times where it was very conversational and very relaxed. And I was just kind of speaking from the heart. And I think it, I think it, it transversed really, really well. It's all a learning experience. You know, it's all, a, you know, I think a noble pursuit to get good at this, but this was a different one than the other one. And so I, I definitely was keenly aware of the wins, you know, a few, my wife was there. She took a bunch of videos. Some friends were there, took some video, you know, aware of the losses, you know, the casualties yeah. as well. 
And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all rather than get too high about the ups and too low about the downs, it's just more like it's another step in kind of my journey to get good at this thing. I definitely want to keep doing it. And, um, and I want to really be much better at, at holding an audience's rapt attention. I think, I think I did a good job emoting the music. I think tying the music together and making it much more of a, a vibe that I had in my head. Yeah. I, I, I didn't do as well this time as I did last time. Well, and you know, being, and you're less than 24 hours away from this, right? So yeah. being aware of that and also being able to talk about it sort of matter of factly and without emotion and all of that, like to me, that's the sign <laughs> of a pro. Yeah, uh, I mean, like, cause I, I, like, that's that's really impressive. I don't know that, and I'm pretty self aware. <laughs> I, I don't know that I'd be quite in. I, I don't know that I'd I'd have turned that corner yet. I would yeah. eventually. I know that I do, right? You know, but but it it like, twenty four hours is usually the minimum it takes me. So that's pretty that's good, funny. man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said, it's it's uh, you know it's as close as I come to original music. It's music that really right. resonates with me. Right. Yep. And I, and the moments that were good were really, really, really rewarding. And I don't think that there was anything that was, there was nothing bad. Sure. Right. But there's moments that in my head playing the show out in advance that I thought would go over one way that didn't go that way. Yeah. Or there's things that, you know, I just quite simply didn't reach like the emotional communication. Like, the, you know, the rising was a was a really strong song for me the last time I did it. Yeah. And I assumed it was going to be a strong song for me this time. And I was really trying to dig in. But I could tell that the that it just wasn't. You know, I don't know why. Right. 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 But of it course. just wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. And so. And in that moment when I'm reflecting and realizing that it's not the same, um, I'm, you know, you're having a little bit of an internal dialogue while you're trying to perform the song, right? <laughs> totally. So, so that's, you know, you get in your head and that's a bad place to be, I think, in general, uh, when you're trying to emote art, but, um, but a lesson learned. And then there were other things where I disappeared in a song and uh, it felt good to me. And then you get, you know, again, it's like, a, it's a theater, so it's dark on the audience. I can't see people. I can only kind of feel sure. and what they do at the end of a song. And then, you know, there are a couple of songs that were really nice, soft passages and, and uh, people really responded to them. Well, um, I don't play harp well. Right. So sure. I, okay. I can cop a, a Springsteen or a Neil Young, you know, kind of, you know, the, these are not the most technical harp playing dudes out there, but I can cop those types of parts. I can't, I can't improvise, but I can listen to something and, you know, come pretty close to it. And I played harp for the first time on Ghost of Tom Joad, and that came out pretty well. I think there's a huh. video on, on Facebook and that, that was pretty rewarding. But like I said, this whole thing to me is, you know, if, if you're a trained musician and your, your path has been, you know, do your homework every day and figure out how to make a life of it. And, you know, that's been a kind of a singular path for you. You might have a different perspective on doing these types of things. Me, you know, I'm a, I'm a largely self-taught guy right. who, you know, really feels that this is inside of me and I want to, I want to, I want to get it out huh. and, and, uh, you know, finding a path to being good at it. Like I said, I'm natural, not a natural singer. I've taken a lot of singing lessons and I've learned enough to be able to control my voice to a great degree and how to fix things on the fly. You're going, but you know, it's not like, you know, it's, it's not like you're, you're hearing beautiful tenor, but like I said, the, you know, the great encouraging thing from that Springsteen biography, when he says the ability to inhabit your songs goes a long way for a rock and roll singer. That's a really, you know, <laughs> that's a very comforting thought. That's it. Well, yeah, that that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. inhabiting these songs, I guess, is the point is, you know, truly trying to find a way to communicate the stories, which I truly disappear into. And when that happens, it's like, you know, like you talk about those magic moments on stage when all the musicians are are clicking in something without words being spoken. Yeah, that that's what this is like to me when this yeah. when this song or story that resonates with me, if I can inhabit it and interpret it and have people react to it, that's kind of everything for me. Well, that, and that's that's the key. But being able to get out of your own head, uh. regardless of, you know, the negative. I mean, you want to take like the positive stuff and let that in and let that inspire you. So you can't just tune out the entirety of it. But setting that filter so that, you know, the negative stuff like doesn't impact you unless it's so bad that you you need to make a change. Like that's really hard to do. Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, it 
It yeah. is the subtle things about being a true professional. And again, it's not out of the reach of anybody. It's, you know, you got to practice it and practice it and practice it and practice it. And, you know, you now have to know how to approach a show. And it's a really rewarding thing. I mean, you know, Mike, my sax player in my band has started doing some solo sax things, sometimes tracks and, um, you know, like in wineries and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, I think he's going through a similar process of, you know, this song that I thought would, would, would rock, you know, is getting a different response in that moment of recognizing that. Are you able to just chill and just yeah, flow make, right make through the a end? Note and move on. That's exactly. right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So I think it's a great pursuit. You know, you're, you're an excellent singer and I think you would learn a lot by trying this. I mean, you're, you're used to being a drummer and an accompanist, although you do these, you know, I know you do your vocal groups and that type of thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's a, even if you start out at open mics or, you know, mini sets, 20 minute sets or something like that, I just find that it's a, it's a great way to discover your own set of talents. It's a great way. Everybody's a star in their mind, right? Yes. It's a, like yeah. I said, no, Some of the raps that I had in my head that I was ready to kind of like dazzle people with my knowledge of, of uh, you know, Springsteen history in this case, um, you know, came out a little flat and it came out a little flat and I could feel it at the moment. It came out flat because as I was saying it, it was coming out different than I thought it was in my head. Yep. And, uh, and then in that moment, I, fr you know, your mind is going through, oh, they're going to, they're going to hate this. They're going to hate this. Right. Yep. Imposter. Uh, totally. It's impo Yes. Right. You, yes. Everybody fakes it till they make it. You're not alone. Right. That like, that's the stuff you have to remind yourself of. And, and I, I know you're right that I should go and do like, you know, 20 minutes at an open mic or something like that. Because it, it occasionally, well, more than occasionally in the middle of like a, a monkey fist gig or whatever, somebody will request a tune that that I know uh, both, you know, vocally and on guitar. And so I'll wind up with the guitar in my hand playing this song. Yeah. It basically solo. Right. Because, you know, the, the, if if the guitar has made it to me, it means that no one else knows how to do anything on this song. Right. <laughs> so, so it's really me alone. I mean, they'll join me for harmonies. It's not like they're standing there laughing at me or whatever. But but I know that I'm like carrying the load and uh, and it's always different. I know exactly what you're saying. Like, you, you know, I'll start singing and this will be a gig where I've been singing, especially like harmonies. All night long. Like, it's not the first time I've opened my mouth by any stretch. I'm comfortable. My monitors are good. Like, everything's where I would want it to be. And then suddenly I'm in charge and it's a whole different experience. And it's it's never as good as I would want it to be. Well, always be performing takes on a whole new meaning when it's just you. Yes. Right? Totally. So, it's, you know, it, yeah. and, and it's I think it's a, a growth as a musician to be able to do these types of things. And the foundation for it is rehearsal. Like, you know, if, right. if you don't have to think about your songs because you know them so well. Remember how we said something once once about how, you know, for a lot of musicians, once you hear someone say, uh, you know, I got this, you know, they, they don't got it. Right. 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 You know, when, once you're like, it'll be fine live. I know it enough. And, you know, and you're counting on things clicking into place when you're live. That's not that's oh, not disaster. preparation. Yeah, that's yeah. not preparation. And so, you know, that's the thing is the songs that I was a hundred percent a thousand percent prepared on there there's no thought it just flows those certainly went the best there are a couple songs that were new for me that um and i had a couple cheat sheets on but of you know course, yeah but eh, you know if you're in the moment you're not looking around for your cheat sheets that type of thing and and i refuse to have a music stand on stage for this stuff so um so preparation like stone cold. Yeah. You wouldn't go out and do a, a, a an acting gig if you didn't know your line stone cold. You wouldn't right? hope not. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think for the semi pro musician, often good enough and the assumption that I know it good enough, my brain will work when I need it to on stage. That's yeah. a really that's a really challenge. Well, assumption. and good enough often comes with the and the other guys, you know, we've got this together. Right. And and so doing it completely on your own, there's no one to fall back on. You know, yeah. if you flub something, it's 100 percent up to you to keep the train moving. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. And and then I will add to this uh, right before we go. We're doing, um, as always, you know, kind of preparing for the next Madhouse gig. This one is all Beatles music. Cool. And, uh, yeah, it's great. I told him, I said, all right, look, if, we're, if I'm going to do this, uh we're not going to track anything. You know, we have a band, we can play Beatles songs. And, uh, and I said, I want to be involved in, you know, like pulling the harmonies together. I really didn't want the, the, to put like 
Beatles rock of ages on stage where you've got like, you know, Broadway type yeah. vocals in the rafters all night long or whatever. Moments of that will happen for this. But by and large, it's, you know, if the song had had, you know, two people singing on it, like that's the reason those harmonies work, because it's just two. So just let it be that, you know, and 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 everybody's sort of on board for this. But it, of course, as these things evolve, it turns out I'm singing a few tunes. Yeah. And I'm. You know me, I'm totally comfortable singing on stage, except when there's mm. theater people around, like these people mm. can really, really yep. sing. And man, it's like, it's a whole different, I mean, it's, it's awesome working out harmonies with people where you can sing them a line once and it's in their head. Like, I don't even, I don't know how they do that. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> it's like, wait, you got that George part already? Like, that's impossible. It took me months to get that, but they get it. But, you know, it's I mean, and, and everybody's got different skill sets and, and everybody respects each other. It's not like I am putting myself in in the wrong, not, not in the wrong position. I'm, I cast myself in my in my worst light in this. Like everybody's on board with all of this. But um, but, you know, having to having to sing right after or right before somebody that like does this and has studied this and actually has a really good voice and isn't just a hack rock and roller that's been doing it long enough to get away with it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to give humbling. you humbling. Yeah. Well, it is humbling, but I'm going to give you, you know, I'm going to channel my buddy, Joe, my drummer, buddy, Joe, Joe, um, was very, very comfortable in saying, this is my skill set. I'm very, 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 very good at my skill set. And, uh, his confidence, as long as we were in the circle of his skill set, was very high. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, th there are guys who can walk in and own any room at any time, right? Sure. I, you know, you're you're a very good singer and you know your range and you know music. And so I would say that, uh, you know, and a large part of singing is confidence, right? I don't know about being intimidated. And the way you offset intimidation is know what you can do and do what you can do. And, you know, I think that's a know thyself is a, is a pretty, yeah, it is, but pretty it's, strong. I'm finding it difficult to be confident with the things that I would otherwise normally be confident with. And it's just totally in my head. I mean, yeah. I, I just, you know, I, I know this and it's not like everybody's in there, you know, waiting for me to fail or, I mean, it's, it's like, there's, it's so, it couldn't possibly be a more supportive environment, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's nothing about it other than that which I bring with me. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's interesting. It's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I gotta, but it's, it's, I mean, it's great. Cause I gotta like push through this. It's, it's not like these tunes are difficult for me to sing. It's just, I gotta, you know, it's a weird environment is really what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's all a good journey though. It, oh, totally. Oh, I love it. Yeah. It's great. All right, folks. Well, I think that brings us to the end here. Unless you got anything else, Mr. Kent. No, I'm emotionally spent here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad. I, I'm I'm glad to hear about how your gig went. That was good, man. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Like we said, man, always be performing, even when you're by yourself. Especially. Especially. Yeah. <laughs> See you next week.